From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Thanks, Ollie. Welcome to uh, Wednesday's programme. Hope you've had a good day and you're having a good week. It's uh, the BBG, not the BBC. Richie Allen, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Dark uh, evening, dark afternoon, overcast, but pretty mild it is. That's a good thing. You can tweet the programme right now and I'll be reading your tweets until the end of the show. So please do that. Always a pleasure. So it is. Well, bring out the gill. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. I'll be joined by Kevin Barrett, truthjihad.com, brilliant academic, writer, author, journalist, lecturer, I could be here all day, broadcaster, Kevin Barrett will be on to talk about Google deleting Press TV's YouTube channel, but we'll also talk about Donald Trump's proposals for the partition of Palestine, his two-state solution, which has been laughed at and derided by the Palestinian authorities. We'll talk about that and much more with Kevin Barrett. This uh, Richie Allen radio show, it is the 29th of January. I'll stop telling you what year it is because you're not stupid, goddammit. You're not stupid. What's going on in the world? What's going on? There's mad things happening. I've been told in the last couple of minutes that Alistair Stewart, who's an, a household name in the UK, because for decades... Alistair has been reading the news for ITN, okay, which is broadcast by ITV. He's been reading the news since the 80s. And it's been announced in the last few minutes that Alistair Stewart is stepping down immediately because of errors of judgment in his use of social media. As of yet, we don't know what Alistair said on social media, which could be Twitter, could be Facebook, it could be Instagram, it could be other things. What did he say? Alistair has deleted his Twitter account. Ah, there's the answer then. I should have read the third paragraph. Alistair deleted his Twitter account and he said it was a misjudgment which I regret. But it's been a privilege to bring the news to homes in the UK for 40 years. What did you say, man? I want to know what he said. Please help out uh, me. Please help me out because I'm wondering how serious is it. Newsreaders of your of yesteryear, obviously, could never be seen to editorialise, obviously on air, but they could never be seen to express an opinion, politically or, or otherwise, outside the job. I wonder, was it something as innocuous as him expressing his opinion on Brexit or on the royal family? I don't know, but I'm very interested in it. It's a day for people getting banned and having to resign because of things they said. Yeah. Okay. Alistair Stewart. If you're outside the UK, you probably won't know who he is. You'll know him if you're in Ireland. But you won't know him elsewhere, I don't imagine. It's a mad, mad time. Zachary Lehman writes for RT.com. And he writes that Stephen King... Now, I'm a Stephen King super fan. I still am. I've got all the books. All the books. I scared the absolute pyjamas off myself when I was a youngster. Reading Christine... Carrie, Pet Cemetery, the Bachman books. I was too young to read them, but I read them and scared the pyjamas off me. I was terrified. It, I read It, not after, not long after it came out in the mid-80s. Love the man, but he's letting the side down, dear, uh, dear listener. He's letting the side down. Stephen, in commenting on the Oscar row, quite rightly tweeted last week, I would never consider diversity in matters of art, only quality. It seems to me that to do otherwise would be wrong. Well said, Stephen. Ma on buckle. What difference does it make what colour somebody is? You either like the film or you don't. Or you find something intrinsically pleasing about the way it was created, the sound, the editing, the cinematography, or you don't. You couldn't give a rat's arse about the colour of the people behind it. Good man, Stephen. But then Twitter went to war on Stephen King with the filmmaker Ava DuVernay 
jumping in to stay, and she said, a woman of colour, when you wake up, meditate, stretch, reach for your phone, she says, to check on the world and see a tweet from someone you admire that is so backward and ignorant you want to go back to bed. Fuck off, Ava. Fuck off back to bed. And don't ever get out of it again. You miserable snowflake. He's right. Diversity doesn't come into it. You either like the art or you don't. And you are able to express why you like it, which I was never very good at, or you don't. Right. Anyway, Stephen backtracked. He was called a white privileged male and he wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post where he flip-flopped so much he nearly disappeared off the fucking edge of America and said the Oscars are rigged in favour of white folks. Stephen King... You cowardly baxter you. Oh, God. Hey, listen, the coronavirus mystery has been solved. To hell with the monkeys and the snakes, in the markets, in Wuhan. Fuck all to do with that. And it's not a hoax either. John Rappaport, I love John. John is wrong. This time we know what it is. It's the real deal, this pandemic. It's a genuine pandemic. It's real. And uh, we know this because we were told today by Pastor Rick Wiles. Rick Wiles said, and I don't know why we didn't think of it sooner, right, that coronavirus is a plague sent by God to purge sin off this planet and it's the final straw for the Lord Jesus. Right? The sin. And the absolute straw that broke the camel's back for the baby Jesus is parents transgendering their children. Pastor Rick Wiles, he's not having any of this. It's a plague, goddammit. My spirit bears witness that this is a genuine plague. Hang on, hang on, we need music. Oh, we need music, I tells you. This deserves a theme tune running in the background. Oh, yeah. Listen to Pastor Rick Wiles talking about the plague visited upon the sick children and the transgenders by God himself. Here's the preacher. My spirit bears witness that this is a genuine plague that's coming upon the earth. And God is about to purge a lot of sin off this planet. Plagues are one of the last steps of judgment. Yes. The very last step is war. That's the last step. But plagues and pestilence, those are one of the steps of judgment. When nations refuse, look at China godless state, a godless government, godless communist government that persecutes Christians. Commie bastards! Forced abortions. I, they're not, they're the Chinese communists are not virtuous people. They're godless. They're not God's children. I'm not talking about the Chinese people. I'm talking about the government. Right. Okay. Look at the United States. Look at the rebellion, the spiritual rebellion that's in this country. The hatred of God, the hatred of the Bible, the hatred of righteousness. Hatred of innocence. Hatred of innocence. The hatred of innocence. <laughs> There's vile, disgusting people in this country now. Transgendering little children, perverting them. Look at the rapes and the, the sexual immorality and this, uh, the filth on our TVs and He's our, got a point, God damn it. Our movies and... Folks, the Death Angel. De- a what now? Death Angel. Death Angel. Maybe moving right now across the planet. And it's a terrifying thing when the Death Angel yes. walks by your door. That's right. This is a time to get right with God. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And get baptized. Get baptized. Savior. If you've not been baptized, you yes. need to be baptized yes. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus Christ will protect you. Do not fear. If you're living right for God, if the blood of Jesus Christ is on you, you have no reason to fear this death angel. But those of you who are opposing the church of God, mocking God, attacking his servants, Wait for this. you better wise up. Because there, there's a death angel on the loose right now. There's a death angel on the loose right now. Adjustment. And you're going to get an attitude adjustment. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. Mystery solved. It's a plague visited upon the Chinese because they're godless commie bastards. 
according to Pastor Rick Wiles. Yeah. I Listen, he makes a good point about forcing this ideology of transgender onto children. But the rest of it, well... <laughs> Oh, Christ. Hellfire and damnation is everywhere today. That preacher probably likes Israel Folau, the Aussie, who joined the Catalan Dragons yesterday. Israel is a brilliant rugby player, both codes. Brilliant. And he was fired by the Australian Rugby Union authorities because he said that gays are going to hell. Israel is a preacher too, you see. And he just believes this nonsense and good luck to him. Gays are going to hell, he says. What's nonsense? I don't believe in hell. And I don't believe that being gay could be a sin. Personally. But anyway, you know I'm not virtue signaling. I don't care. It's what I think. Uh, the BBC spoke to Halifax player Keegan Hurst. Now, Keegan is out and proud. He's a gay boy. Oh, he's gay. And he plays rugby league. And he's not happy. That's Hallelujah is still playing there. Hang on. Hang on. Keegan who plays for Halifax, is not happy at all that the league has allowed Israel Folau come and earn a crust by playing in this country. He was on BBC Radio 5 Live this morning. Here's Keegan Hurst. Keegan Hurst, uh, rugby league player, uh, LGBT. Uh, sorry, it's Halifax. Got you. you know, I used to play for Wakefield Trinity. Sorry, Keegan, I said uh, Wakefield Trinity. How are you this morning? I'm good, thank you. What do you think about the signing of Israel Folau? Um, Catalan Dragons. It's it's just it's disappointing. It's really disappointing, and it's it's very frustrating. Um, Rugby league champions itself on being tolerant and inclusive and diverse, and except for evangelical Christians. And people work really hard, boots on the ground in communities, promoting those values. And this signing and the lack of being able to stop it by the RFL and Super League is just a slap in the face to all those people's hard work, All anyone who was LGBT who was involved in the game, whether that's players, fans, officials, um, and anyone who's got any kind of moral compass um, and values, it's just alienating and undermining all those people. He's the one claiming the moral compass, of course. Do you mm. think he should ever be allowed to ply his trade again? I think well, should he be allowed to play his trade again? Ask Nicky Campbell. Ever play professional rugby because he thinks gays are going to hell? This is well. I think um, people people talk about second chances, and of course, everyone deserves a second chance. But to get a second chance, I think you have to be sorry for the mistake that you made, show some remorse, and want to better yourself and move on. Yeah, but he doesn't think he made a mistake. He believes in a version of. The baby Jesus. He's got his own version of the baby Jesus and the Holy Trinity and it tells him, it communicates to him that homosexuality is evil, it's a sin and it's going to result in the fornicating homosexual being cast into eternal flame. I think it's horseshit myself, but that's what he thinks. So he's not going to repent or show some remorse, Keegan. So does that mean then that he can never work again? Anywhere? Because he doesn't like the gays? Now, that's not been the case. All his uh, anti-gay sentiment is still up. Still, uh, uh, you know, people can still see it. He's not taking it down. So there's absolutely no remorse there. I was just looking at his Insta, actually, yeah. just to check. Because, I, I mean, I don't follow him, obviously. But, um, yeah, it's all there. He's yeah, gone to his page. Yeah, they're not supposed to agree with Keegan. This is why I, I would die before I would pay the BBC licence fee. That's Rachel Borden there. One of the worst fucking presenters ever to sit behind a microphone anywhere. Absolutely wretched. Oh, I don't follow him, obviously. Oh, it's all there. You're not supposed to agree with him, love. Not supposed to agree with him. You're supposed to be impartial. You're supposed to make the case that, well, Keegan, you might find his views repugnant and many gay men and women might do, but he's entitled to his opinion. He's entitled to be wrong, Keegan. Surely we can't deny the man the right to make a living. You're just going to have to fucking get used to it, Keegan. That we live in a world where people have weird and wacky and wonderful ideas. No, she agrees with him. She fucking agrees with him on the BBC. Anyway. Yeah, he's not He's not sorry about it. He's, he doesn't want to... And, and I'm not... It's not a case of changing his beliefs. Everyone is... I, I want to make this really clear. Everyone is entitled to their beliefs, whether they are religious, whether they are political. But he's obviously not entitled to his beliefs if you don't want to 
allow him to play professional rugby league in England, Keegan. Well, that would mean he's not entitled to his beliefs. Well, there's a bit of contradiction going on here. But to use those beliefs to justify any form of prejudice, whether that's homophobia, racism, misogyny, whatever... Where's the prejudice? Where's the prejudice? I don't understand how Israel Folau has showed prejudice against gay people. Has he prevented gay people from attaining employment gainfully? Has he? Has he prevented gay people from joining local sports teams in his neighbourhood? What has he done that's been prejudicial? He just fucking believes that being gay is a sin. So does Anne Whittacombe. Just thought of that. Whatever it may be is not okay. Um, and, and we talk about... It is okay, though. It is. It is okay to think like that. I thought you said you didn't agree with it, Richie. I don't. I do not agree with it. I think it's preposterous, the notion of hell. The notion that somebody is committing an offence by being with somebody they love. It's preposterous to me. But it is okay if somebody thinks that. Of course it's okay. What are we going to do now? Start cracking people's fucking heads open? Scooping out their fucking brains, give them a lobotomy because they're not thinking right. According to who? When has it ever hurt any gay man or woman that some evangelical fucking arsehole thinks that they're going to hell? Come on. Freedom of speech, and of course, everyone has the right to freedom of speech. Except Israel Folau. But when that freedom of speech is incendiary or discriminatory, then it needs to be called out and challenged. There are a lot of evangelical Christians and uh, orthodox Muslims, we have to say, who believe that homosexuals will burn in hell. Should they just shut up? Um, if, if that's their belief, they, they, have, they don't have hundreds of thousands of followers. They are not put on a pedestal as a role model yeah. for kids. What did he just say there? That was very interesting. He said, Campbell said, should those people just shut up? The others, the Muslims and the other Christians. And he said, well, basically, they don't have the same following as Israel Folau. So really, he's more worried about the following that Folau has than the actual statements made by Folau himself. It's all a bit mad. You're probably wondering, um, Richie, we've heard three minutes of this and we've not heard any virtue signalling from Nicky Campbell. Surely there was some nauseating virtue signalling from Nicky Campbell. Fear not, dear listener. Of course there was. Here's Nicky. It's a nonsense we hear from uh, evangelical preachers all the time, but it's so toxic with young gay people, you know, on the, on the ver lives are ruined, you know, devastated, <laughs> and then hear something like this, as you say, from their role model. It is absolutely poisonous, and isn't it? What? It's a nonsense we hear from uh, evangelical preachers all the time, but it's so toxic with young gay people, you know, on the... Young gay people? On the, on the ver lives are ruined. Lives are ruined? You know, devastated, then hear... Devastated? And hear something like this, as you say. When they hear something like this, young people's lives are ruined and they're devastated. When a fucking Christian lunatic, <laughs> sorry, a far-right conservative Christian lunatic, says that gays are going to hell. Lives are ruined, are they, Nicky? Imagine, imagine being asked to pay £150 a year for that horse shit, imagine. 21 minutes past the hour, the Richie Allen radio show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. Let's very quickly move on. This is very serious. A United Nations document is getting nationalists annoyed. Maybe justifiably. It concerns social care and the fact that fertility rates are declining in first world countries. It says that people might not have children to help look after them in their senior years in years to come. And the United Nations says migrants might have to replace the non-existent children and that is the united nations word of choice replace and it gets people's backs up for obvious reasons i thought john waters the irish journalist spoke very eloquently the other day about why people are concerned about countries being turned inside out and culture disappearing and people being replaced I thought he did a great job john so the un talking about people being replaced Talk Radio's Mike Graham today and a caller called Nick. Well, they had a good laugh at the expense of those who worry about being replaced. This is pathetic radio, but have a listen to it anyway. I decided to look into what's uh, sort of stirring up all these simpletons. Yeah. And so I looked at this report that they're obsessing with on the UN website. Oh, yeah. And basically what it is, is they're looking at countries who have a declining population, so like Germany or, or Japan. Yeah. And um, what they're saying there is, you know, as people get older, if you don't have enough children who are then growing up to 
to look after those people as they get old, mm. then you're going to have a crisis in social care, right? Right. And, um, and what this report said was, you know, one of the potential solutions to that is to bring in migrants. Yeah. And uh, basically what these people have done is they've seen that the guy who wrote that report, it's not policy, it's not something you end up doing, but it's a report that was written for them. Right. Um, Don't worry about it. It's not a policy yet. It's just a fucking report where they're talking about replacing the children that are not being born with migrants to look after people in their old age. Nothing to see here, eh? Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the document. It's very clearly a report. It's very clearly yeah. a statement of fact. It's very clearly a statement of intent. It is not. What it is not is some kind of policy. So it's a statement of intent, says Mike Graham, but it's not policy. Well, it's nearly the same thing. It's an intention to do that, to demand, you know, of countries that they accept that they will need a flow of migrants to come into the country to work for pittance and to look after people in their old age. Because that's what your auntie, that's what your auntie Doris fucking deserves, by the way. When she's 79 years of age and, you know, she's, she's living on her own. She's in good form now. She's healthy, Doris. She's looking well and she's compass mentis. Right? But maybe her husband passed away. No children. And Doris thinks, yeah, well, there are things I can't do for myself. You know, I need to go into a care home. That's what we should do to our senior citizens, to the men and women who raised us, who taught us, who nurtured us, who looked after us, fuck them into a home and then get somebody who barely speaks two words of fucking English to look after them. Brilliant. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing to see here. Please disperse, you know, fine. Yeah, and it's because he used the word replacement. What these guys have done is they've gone, replacement, oh my God, they're going to replace us. And, uh, and then what they've done is they've then mixed... He finds that very funny, the presenter. Up, um, ...with a different report that said that basically because the world is connected now and there are cheap flights and right. people are flying around the world and falling in love with people that look different to them, yeah. then, you know, everyone's going to end up... In the end, everyone's going to have a descendant who's mixed race, right? Right. And what these people Which seems to worry is, these oh, people uh, 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 unnecessarily. Yeah, and, and what they're saying is that... Someone, one of their descendants, like their grandchild, might fall in love with someone that's a different colour, right. and then their child may look slightly different, and that's a problem for them. Right. And they're also saying that their bum might get wiped by someone who's a different right. colour to them when they're old. And there's only one reason why somebody would not like that, isn't there? Yeah, it's because they're racist. It's yeah. as simple of as that. course, you must be racist if you are worried about the changing landscape of your community that you're surrounded by more and more people who don't speak English or speak the same language as you. You must be racist if you're concerned that public services are under enormous pressure because you're leaving in far more immigrants into the country, economic migrants, by the way, than you should be doing. Well, you must be fucking racist, really. You know, if you're talking about these things. You must be some sort of unpalatable, ignorant bigot. Surely you must be. You know, you can't just be a concerned citizen. You must hold hatred in your heart for people who look different than you. Ah, the media. Ah, the media, the media, the media. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show. This is Bruce the Boss Springsteen. Kevin Barrett joins me in three and a half minutes' time. Badlands, Bruce Springsteen on the Richie Allen Show. It's half past five. Wednesday's programme. January 29th, 2020. It's all kicking off. Reported this morning. Devastating for me because when I was in London, I got to know some of the guys in Hangar Lane, London. Uh, ir- 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 Iranian lads who worked for Press TV in London. And they were gentlemen. All of them. And they did some very good journalism there. You know, they got criticised, obviously, because of the control that the Iranian government has on on press TV. But then, as I've said before a thousand times, and it isn't what about Tari, what's the difference? You know, levelling accusations against press TV. What about the BBC? What about Fox News? Fox News is nothing more than a mouthpiece for the GOP. And it's never been more aggressive than it is now in defending the tyrant that is Donald Trump. How dare anybody cast any aspersions on Press TV? Shockingly, 
Google has deleted the Press TV channel. And it was very useful, that, as a news outlet. I watched a lot of it live, and I was able to glean a lot of very interesting information about the Middle East that I wouldn't have gotten, obviously from the BBC or the Telegraph or the Guardian or anywhere else. It's shocking, and um, it's, I suppose it's devastating for my uh, friend Kevin Barrett, whom you know very well, truthjihad.com, academic of distinction, writer, broadcaster, and um, a great guy to have on any radio programme. Kevin, lovely to have you back on the programme, first time in 2020. I was disgusted, devastated, and to be honest with you, mate, my heart was broken to learn that uh, Google could just delete Press TV's YouTube channel. I, I don't I don't imagine this is one of your better days, my friend. Well, you know, I hadn't actually really looked into that. I, I'm sure you can still get Press TV, right? You can still go to PressTV.ir or PressTV.com and watch Press TV. But yeah, Google censorship is uh, is ridiculous. It's It's gotten to the point that it's only worth using the Google search engine if you're looking for what Big Brother thinks about things. Yeah. Anybody else, you have to go to DuckDuckGo or some other alternative search engine. So yeah, it's, it's pretty pathetic. The big internet monopolies are essentially the uh, Orwellian mind control outfit of our time. The problem with them, um, you're right to say that it can be watched on Press TV's channel, at least for now, Kevin, because Google is looking at, as far as I can understand, not listing it in its search results, making it difficult to find. The thing about YouTube channels, of course, is they're full of archive, aren't they? Like Press TV's channel, RT's channel, is full of interviews and reports going back several years, which are very useful. It's almost like a library of sorts. It's horrendous that they can get away with doing this. It really is. It's funny you mention Google as a search engine. You know, if you use Bing and Google side by side, and you look for certain information about Syria... At least on Bing, Kevin, you'll still get information from people like yourself. You'll show up. Um, some of your colleagues will show up, which is a good thing. But on Google these days, no, you don't show up at all. Yeah, it's terrible. And you're right that the deletion of the archives of Press TV from YouTube is a terrible scandal. Uh, this isn't the first time it's happened. It's actually happened several times. Every time I go on Press TV, I make sure I grab that video quickly and then I post it on my own YouTube channel, which who knows how long that's going to be up. Yeah. But so far, I've beat back several attempts to get rid of me uh, by uh, making an argument that, you know, there's nothing that I'm putting up there that is violating their terms of service. Uh, but, yeah, that's terrible. YouTube has become totally controlled uh, under its parent company, Google. And Facebook is actually the worst, Richie. I don't know if you're paying attention to Facebook, but they just cre did the biggest censorship campaign in the history of the world by deleting and blocking presumably tens of millions of items mourning the great martyred general Qasem Soleimani. And that that's, yeah. uh, you know, that everybody in Iran loves this guy. Whatever you think about anything else in Iran, everybody is united in loving Qasem Soleimani. He had the highest popularity rating of anybody in Iran. And everybody in the region loves him, even his enemies. Uh, the Sunni Muslims who aren't on board with the Iranian program for the region uh, love the guy personally. Uh, and so the tributes to him that went out were the greatest you know, wave of tributes ever in history. And they were completely stifled uh, by Facebook and in Instagram, which is big in the Middle East. So that, that was actually a, a stunning manifestation of censorship. And I'll tell you that the reverberations of this murder of Soleimani are going to go on for a long time. And I'm pretty sure that his revenge is going to be the complete uh, end of the U.S. and Zionist presence in the region. We're definitely going to come back to Qasem Soleimani and what happened there, because we haven't spoken since then. Just staying briefly on social media, is it obvious now? Is, is, is it settled? The idea that this was some very sick, evil, twisted plan all along to make these social media companies, to grow them to behemoth size, get everybody in there, make them the only game or the games in town, so you've got nowhere else to go, basically. Billions of users... And then it's much easier to control what people see and what people don't see. Do we accept now that it's not just bad practice or it's not just bad policy decisions? This might have been the plan all along. I think it was, Richie. I think it's the world's biggest bait-and-switch operation ever. 
They baited us into these monopoly platforms by promising that they would respect the American First Amendment, which provides the best free speech protections in the world. That's why here in the United States, those of us who've actually read something about the Holocaust can say, you know, it's just not obvious that the official version of that is true. We can say that in the United States. You say that in Germany, you'll go to prison. And likewise, there's so many other issues where in the United States, despite all of the horrific aspects of this country, which I'm the first to criticize, at least we have had a vibrant tradition of relatively free speech. And so these companies based in the United States said, we're going to be the strongest supporters of free speech in world history. We're going to make sure that everybody in all these poor oppressed countries where they don't have these protections has total free speech. And so everybody went all in. And then once they were all in, as you said, they turned it into the world's biggest gulag. It's disgusting. And the, the governments of the world, they get a pass because they can say, hey, listen, we're not interfering with private enterprise. These are private companies. And if a private company wants to say, um, well, we, you know, you came onto our platform and you signed up to our rules and regulations. This is our club. We reserve the right to kick you out whether you like it or not. And that's a pass for governments, isn't it? That, that, that's how governments get away with not dealing with Facebook and Google and Instagram. Well, that's why the corporatist neoliberal system in the West isn't really any better at protecting freedom than the communist system in some place like China or Cuba. In some ways, it's worse. It's certainly worse in terms of protecting people's economic freedom, such as the ability to not die of being too poor for having health care, uh, the ability to have decent public services that keep you alive and healthy and happy and so on and so forth. Obviously, the socialist systems are better in those respects. But traditionally, we always thought that the neoliberal Western corporate capitalist system would at least protect our freedom of speech. But now it seems that these corporations have gotten to be just about as powerful as governments. They really own the government. So we're living in disguised oligarchies in which elections don't matter very much anymore because these oligarchs, these billionaires who run everything, can just buy elections. They can buy politicians. They can buy uh, murderers, whether they're in uniform as supposed soldiers or whether they're just mafia killers. It doesn't really make any difference. The same people do both jobs as John Perkins, the economic hitman, has described. So this corporate tyranny in the West under neoliberalism has gotten to be almost worse than communism. And I hate to say that. I'm not a fan of communism really either. But uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's not so much just the governments that we should blame for this. These corporations actually own the governments. And so if we want to fix things, we don't want to just strip back the power of governments. On the contrary, we need to give the governments more power in the right way, such as antitrust power. Having a monopoly is illegal in the United States. Any monopoly, that is anything that's big enough to restrict absolute free trade, you know, to stop startups from being able to compete on an equal basis, is de facto illegal in the United States. So all of these guys should be in jail. Every single uh, owner and decision maker and shareholder even in any of these big internet monopolies is a criminal here in the United States violating the antitrust laws. But because the corporations run everything now, we don't enforce these antitrust laws anymore. So what is it going to take? Are we going to have to be vigilantes and go out and get justice ourselves with our own hands and our own Second Amendment rights? It's starting to look like that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I don't like that either, because like yourself, I, don't, I, sh I, sh I shouldn't be putting words in your mouth. I believe in non-violent civil disobedience and, you know, violence only is a means of self-defence last resort, but we can yes, talk. Yes, I agree. And I, 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 I knew you agreed with that. Um, the 13th of November 2006 should be a red letter day in, in human history, but it isn't. That's the day that Google was allowed to buy YouTube, which was a disgrace because there were already several video sharing platforms operational in the world at the time. And it was obvious to even the stupidest you know, laziest brain in the world that Google shouldn't be allowed to acquire YouTube because those other video sharing platforms were dependent on uh, Google to be fair in terms of, you know, um, 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 showing, showing them, showing those other video uh, sharing platforms in their search results. And yet this completely anti-competitive thing was allowed to happen. November 13, 2006, Google was allowed to buy YouTube. Should be a red letter day, shouldn't it, Kevin, in, in our history? Because it was massive. Yeah, massive. Absolutely. 
that was one one week and one day after the fifth uh, of November, <laughs> which yeah. uh, the V for Vendetta anarchist movement has tried to immortalize as a slightly different type of holiday than it actually is in the British Isles. But yeah, that that should have started a worldwide revolution. People should have awakened and noticed that this bait and switch operation had uh, yeah. shepherded them into these uh, essentially uh, concentration camps to you know to to end the traditional Western liberties. But you know, we missed it, and now we're paying for it. Now we're paying for it. Kevin Barrett is our guest. I know you know Kevin. If it's the first time you've listened to this radio program, you might be new to this program. You might be new to Kevin. Check him out at truthjihad.com. Remarkable man, Kevin. Um, I first came across him many years ago when Fox News was trying to destroy him uh, for doing his job, you know, for chatting with his students openly about things, uh, geopolitics. They tried to destroy him. They tried to pin... Um, some nonsense on him that he was that he was uh, telling his students not to believe in the official version of 9-11, which he wasn't doing. Uh, brilliant stuff. He stood up to that. And he's been writing and broadcasting and traveling ever since talking about these issues. Let's talk about Donald Trump and Benjamin or Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, the Palestinians, understandably, have laughed out of town the peace plan proposed by Donald Trump for the region, for the Middle East, for Palestine. Um, no better man than you, Kevin, to explain in very simple terms for our listeners, uh, because you are a journalist, what is it that Trump was offering and why, understandably, are the Palestinians so absolutely pissed off about it? Do you want to explain it? Well, sure. Trump doesn't have the faintest idea what's going on. He was just reading off a teleprompter and pronouncing a lot of words wrong. He talked about the al aqua Mosque. It's actually the Al Aqsa Mosque, Don. But uh, so he, he's utterly and completely ignorant, and everything he knows about this issue comes from none other than Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, who is a an organized crime figure. His father did time in federal prison. They're one of the big kosher Nostra families in the New York area. So Trump uh, put this gangster, this moron, you know, twenty-year-old, or maybe he turned thirty. I don't know. But he's he's has no experience. Uh, he's not much smarter than Trump is, actually. But uh, he's a well-connected gangster who has had Bibi Netanyahu as a house guest. And so Trump let him write the new Middle East policy. And so what is it? It's, uh, it's insane. I mean, these, these are not even uh, decent surrender terms for the Palestinians, no. right? It's like if they put guns to the heads of every single Palestinian and said, sign these surrender terms, the Palestinians would all say, shoot. Go ahead and shoot me before I sign these. If you're going to make us surrender, at least give us some uh, slightly more fair surrender terms. I mean, this is insane. You know, the whole world, Richie, knows that every square centimeter of land stolen by the Israelis in their war of aggression in 1967, which was pre-planned for at least a decade by the Hawks, at that time Ben Gurion and his friends, as a way of stealing territory, everybody knows that that will not stand the whole world has the official policy in every country except now the united states and maybe you know some you know some tiny country somewhere that the zionists have bribed the official policy of the entire world has always been that every square centimeter of that land that the israelis stole in 1967 has to come back to the palestinians That's and that right. includes the vast majority of jerusalem al-quds the world's holy city and so that's the bottom line. You can't you can't change that part. The Israelis have been trying to create facts on the ground by putting nearly three quarters of a million uh, fanatical, armed, racist, murderous, genocidal settlers on this land that the entire world says belongs to Palestine. And so this is a non-starter. Actually, you know, it's really simple. The, the real terms of any actual peace agreement, which will be favorable to the Israelis, not the Palestinians, would be simple. That is back to you know, back to the pre sixty seven borders, uh, right? Theoretical right of return. That is, all the Palestinian genocide victims, ethnic cleansing victims, have the right, theoretically at least, to return to their lands and be compensated, uh, both with actual damages and punitive damages for their suffering. And how that is actually implemented is something that can take a fair bit of time, right? That these this is the basic outline of a solution. And that means that Jerusalem al-Quds will remain as it has throughout, throughout the entire history of Islam as a largely Islamically administered holy city in which 
members of all religions are free to come and worship. So that's the the only solution that the entire world has agreed on. It's not fair to the Palestinians because there should be no genocidal Zionist entity squatting in occupied Palestine in the first place. These criminals from all over the world came and committed genocide there, and they should pay for their crimes, and they should at the very least get out. But that's not going to happen, let's face it. So a peace plan means going back to the pre-67 borders and uh, accepting, if not fully implementing, right of return. And, you know, everybody agrees on that worldwide. And this so-called peace plan is just, let's give the Palestinians a couple of tiny little Bantu stands that are barely even connected together. We Israelis are going to steal all of Jerusalem. We're going to steal the Jordan Valley so that what these tiny little Bantu stands that we're going to call New Palestine are not even, not only are they not connected with each other, but they're not connected with the outside world either. They're totally surrounded by Israel. So basically we're going to put, we're going to push the Palestinians into even smaller concentration camps and death camps than they're in now. And presumably we're, you know, even though they say they're going to give them money and a better economy, the reality is just like Gaza today, these are going to be death camps. The Israelis are flooding the agricultural lands in Gaza so people will starve. They're bombing sewage plants so people are drinking raw sewage. Uh, Every year they mow the lawn by dropping white phosphorus on schools and ambulances and hospitals, burning thousands of civilians to death. And they're going to keep doing that. So this this plan is basically telling the Palestinians, just submit to ongoing genocide until you're all dead. Yeah, the Trump map, the one he stood over with Netanyahu, was absolutely sick, really. Um, I saw saw a diagram of it in the Telegraph newspaper uh, this morning. So the the international community, if we call them that, have declared the settlements to be totally illegal. And the international community um, would would, would agree, well, well, has declared, as you've said, uh, pre-67 borders and right of return for Palestinians. The Israelis are never going to agree to that. The international community is pathetic because it's terrified of Israel. It won't do anything. Nobody has ever mentioned, as far as I know anyway, I've never heard a politician mention sanctioning Israel back to the Stone Age for what it does. So all I see in the meantime, not that I'm a defeatist, I'm a realist, is that nothing happens. I believe this proposal was meant to be batted back across the table by the Palestinians and Trump might very well win a second term in office and it doesn't matter whether he does or whether he doesn't. It doesn't matter if Bernie Sanders comes in. It doesn't matter if it's Joe Biden because now the settlements will continue and the atrocities committed against the Palestinians on a daily basis will just continue unabated, right? That's what's going to happen. Well, they will until the balance of power shifts. And there are two key ways that it can and I think will shift. One is the military situation. Hezbollah defeated Israel in 2006. And currently, Iran could utterly and completely destroy Israel. Those rockets that Iran fired at the U.S. facility in Iraq got through whatever defenses were there and hit their targets with absolute precision in a way that's totally unstoppable. And sure, the Israelis' so-called Iron Dome might stop a few rockets, but the Iranians have enough rockets that they can obliterate Demona and turn Israel into a nuclear wasteland, and they could obliterate everything else in Israel too, all of its urban areas, if they fire all of those rockets at once. Yeah, but we don't want uh, that, Kevin. Now, I'm not we? saying that should happen. I'm no. saying that the balance of the military force has already changed, and it can it could easily continue to change even more to the point that Israel will actually feel pressure to change its behavior. That's one aspect. And the other aspect, the world is awakening to understand that these Zionists are the enemies of humanity. They have mass murdered people. They use Jeffrey Epstein and other people like that to control all of the Western governments. That's why none of these governments raise a peep about the Zionists, Richie. You're right. They don't. And that's because they uh, all have been frolicking with little children. And the likes of Jeffrey Epstein, who worked for Israeli military intelligence, have got pictures and videos of them. Once the people wake up to that, woe to you if you're a Zionist. Let me ask you this, my, let me ask you this my, my friend. Kevin Barrett is on the line. Great friend of mine, but I'm going to give him a bit of stick now. He takes it well anyway. I'm going to give you a bit of stick. How do you know that Epstein worked for, um, for Mossad? I've heard this said by people. Nobody has shown me any definitive proof. Now, I know you um, to be genuine in what you say and what you believe. I know that you don't have any hatred in your heart for Jewish people. I know that. But I do hear from people on the programme and they do hate Jews, or they blame everything on Jews. And I hear this Epstein Mossad thing. Why are people so certain that he was involved with Mossad? Why not the CIA or, or MI6 or the National Security Agency? They're just as bad. Why Mossad? 
Well, first, we have direct first-hand testimony from one of his uh, Mossad case officers, Ari ben Menash, who has been very clear and said, yes, I worked with him. I paid it, but it, yeah, it wasn't Mossad, Richie. It was mil Israeli military excuse intelligence. Me, excuse me, you're, so right, Ari, you're right. Ari ben Menash has confirmed this. And uh, secondly, I mean, how obvious does it have to be? I mean, Grizzly Grizzly and Maxwell, daughter of Mossad's super spy, Robert Maxwell, who was murdered by the Mossad because he uh, was having, you know, not giving them the money that they wanted. He was one of the many CNM, these people, many of them billionaires and near trillionaires who work for free for Mossad, helping them mass murder people and sexually blackmail people and things like that in all of the Western capitals. Maxwell uh, was putting his billions of dollars at the service of the Mossad, but then he got in financial trouble. And so he, I think he wanted some of his money back or he wanted to stop handing them money. And so they killed him rather than settle. Uh, but his daughter still kept on working for Israel. And, uh, you know, along with the testimony of Ari ben Menashe, uh, I mean, just, just you know, look, uh, look at what these people were actually doing. Uh, and, and also, I, I would really recommend that people try to get up to speed on the overall issue of Israeli control of the West and how they've achieved it. Uh, two good resources here. One, there's a brand new article over at unz.com, unz.com, where I write. Uh, this is by Ron Unz, the publisher, who is Jewish himself, uh, a very bright guy, uh, one of our most brilliant uh, voices of truth. And his latest article is on Israeli assassinations. Read that. The Israelis have either assassinated, tried to assassinate, uh, nearly assassinate, etc. Such a long list of the leading figures in the West. Winston Churchill was nearly assassinated by the Mossad. They sent bombs to him. Harry Truman was nearly assassinated by the Mossad. John F. Kennedy was assassinated by the Mossad. So was his brother. And on and on and on. The gangster tactics employed by the Zionists are just so off the charts compared to what anybody else on Earth has ever done. And again, th this gives us the context to understand how it is that the networks like the Epstein network control the United States. And we see that the United States is constantly shooting itself in the foot by following policies that benefit the Israelis and not the United States. Why do you think that is? It's because of these assassinations of the greatest Americans like the Kennedys, like the Jewish Senator Paul Wellstone. Uh, it's because of the sexual blackmail like Epstein. And for every, you know, for Epstein is just one guy. There are dozens of Israeli CNM and agents doing the same thing. This is how Israel has captured the West. Yeah, I and, believe um, I believe you're right when it comes to guys like Epstein keeping people in line. I, I have no doubt that he was part of an operation to covertly film powerful men and women or powerful men and women to be men and women whom were earmarked five years or ten years from now to be playing a big part in politics or in business. I have no doubt you're absolutely right about that. And um, a lot of our listeners are tweeting now saying they agree with you. A lot of them are pointing out as well that Zionists are not Jews and that Jews, like any other group of people, either ethnic or identity, whether you're ethnic or identity, um, we all suffer. Everybody suffers because of this plan, this global plan that's rolled out. It's not a Jewish plan. It's, some of our listeners are saying it's a Zionist plan. Now, here's a question for you. You didn't see this one coming. I've been fascinated recently to speak to a number of different researchers. Um, many of them, some of them Catholic, Catholic men. And uh, very smart, bright men, Kev, Kevin like yourself, and they've come to believe that the real power structure, or not the real power structure, but at the very top of the pyramid is the Vatican and the Jesuit order. That's where the real power is. And I've had people like um, um, Eric Kizhevsky, and uh, recently, uh, well, in fact, last night on the program, I had a fascinating conversation with a guy called Johnny Cerucci. I'm sure you know about Johnny. Uh, I know Johnny um, appears with Jim Fetzer from time to time. And these guys say, look, we're not denying the crimes of the state of Israel. We're not denying what Zionist agents do in the West and how they, you know, coerce and, and, and how they bully and how they murder and everything you've just described. But ultimately, it's a front for the Vatican and for the Jesuit order. I find it fascinating, Kevin. And because I don't know bloody squat, right? I listen to anybody and everybody. I wanted to get your take on that. What about that notion that we're, we're being pointed, we're being pushed in one direction? Israel. Israel is evil. 
Israel has all of this control, and it seemingly does, and I would be the first to say that it does. But ultimately, the hidden hand behind all of this is the Jesuit order. And, you know, so many of these big businessmen and women, senators, congressmen, Jesuits, fascinating. What do you think of that? Do you buy into any of that? Well, no, I don't think so. I, I think uh, you know, we have to step back and try to ask ourselves, well, how, how does this actually work? There are these structures, these sort of bureaucratic and hierarchical structures, such as the Jesuit order, such as the state of Israel and its various agencies, uh, such as the Freemasonic lodges, uh, such as a corporation, any given corporation. And then look at the web of the directors of that corporation. They're on, the, on other corporate boards as well. So there are all of these sorts of structures and the individuals who inhabit the nodes of these structures make decisions uh, based on maximizing their own personal wealth and power sometimes but also for ideological reasons and so if we keep that in mind as our basic paradigm what we see richie i think is that though there is uh, a big catholic bureaucracy that owns a lot of property around the world and has some very unsavory connections uh, with banks, with the P2 Freemasonic Lodge, you know, the launders, the CIA's heroin money, and so on and so forth. I think that in today's world, the ideological uh, intensity of Catholics is actually nothing compared to the ideological intensity of Zionists. That is, that the people in the Vatican, the Freemasons who are Catholic, the, uh, the Jesuits, all of these sorts of people, for the most part, I really doubt how fervently Catholic they even really are. I think Western civilization has ceased to be very Christian. And so I think they're actually easy prey to folks and organizations with uh, other agendas, primarily self-enrichment and just grabbing power. That's what most of these folks are really about. Yeah, but, but also, Zionists, hang on, hang ideologically, on, Kevin, hang the Zionists on. are the most, the most single, fervent, intense uh, group out there is this ethnic coalition of fanatical Zionists. Which is what and we I see. Think they have most of the power. Yeah, well, and, and that's a very good answer. But that's what we see. And the guys I've been speaking to, I'm not saying I believe them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very open-minded to everything. You know this. You've been with me for years. Uh, I listen to anybody. I don't know very much. I like to hear all sorts of opinions that get my juices flowing. And they say it's because they're so bloody successful that they seem so benign. And you mentioned that these guys are not religious, but neither are these Zionists. They couldn't give a damn about God. They're anti-God. And that's why so many Jewish people, like you mentioned Ron Unz, I mean, I genuinely feel sorry for Jewish people in this country and in other countries because it's glaringly obvious what Zionists are doing. And let's just say that you're 100% right and they're not doing it as some sort of front for, you know, some Catholic hierarchy. Let's just say you're right and you might very well be right. Um... The fact is, it's out there, it's happening. And I suppose Jews, on, on one hand, religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, they feel, I suppose, tainted by it. I've, I've had a thousand Jews say to me over the years, Richie, Richie, keep making the point, these fuckers, they say, excuse my language, they're not Jews, Richie, they're not us. They don't speak for us. I don't know how they came to be in control of Israel. I don't know how they came to be doing what it is they do, but they're there, they're not us. Do you have any sympathy with that point of view? Oh, absolutely. And I, I really admire uh, the, the people from Jewish backgrounds who have found a way to break out of this mental prison that the Zionists are trying to keep them in. And I agree. It's really the problem is a very small percentage of the Zionist leadership, a very, very small percentage of the Jewish community. Like every other community, the Jewish community has within it a certain number of uh, ambitious, uh, psychopathic, um, very intelligent individuals who can pull on the tribal strings and motivate people. And so they've created this, uh, you know, this Jewish nationalism project uh, of Zionism. And most of the people who believe in it and help it are really dupes of a very, very small number of people who created it in the first place. But, you know, Rich, if you look at the organized Jewish community, what you see is that virtually the entire thing is helping the Zionists, whether it's the the most visible, strongest, best financed part, the part that controls the government of the United States and the government of the UK, uh, those billionaires, uh, or whether it's the Jewish Voices for Peace, uh, for that matter, which never will go all the way and say this whole project of genociding the Palestinians to create a Jewish state is absolutely wrong. 
Um, it seems like the vast majority of the organized Jewish community, whether left or right, whether pro-peace or pro-war, is all part of the Zionist project because the brainwashing has been so effective and intense. And so I do really feel for those Jewish people who have gotten outside of the brainwashing and have seen the uh, horrors uh, that their community is perpetrating because their community has been taken over and is led by diabolical people. And I don't blame, this might annoy you, but it's not meant to annoy you. I don't blame the Zionists ultimately, I blame our own people. I blame our own people for being so shallow, for being so sick and evil and twisted that they can get themselves, you know, find themselves raping children, you know, evil. And then because of that, they're compromised and they're blackmailed and bribed and they go and do what these people want. So they're worse. You know, the, 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 the inhabitants, the, 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 the indigenous people of Britain and France and Ireland, they're feckin' worse than uh, Zionists. And maybe I should reserve more of my ire for them. The brilliant Kevin Barrett is with us. We've got Kevin for a few more minutes. Truthjihad.com. Let's go back to the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, for a while there, Kevin, people worried that it might really kick off, that it might really spark something truly ugly. I didn't know what to think or what was going to happen. Um, the Iranians struck back. There's been stories today about dozens of US soldiers apparently suffering head injuries as a result of the initial um, Iranian response. We had the very unfortunate incident with the Ukrainian airliner as well, which I think I wish the Iranians had, would have admitted that straight away. You know, it's a terrible thing to happen and they have to make restitution to the families of those who died. It, 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 it was an accident, but you know, obviously. They should have come out and admitted it straight away. Take the moral high ground. Um, how have you read what's been happening, Kevin? And do you think in the last few weeks that we came close to a big, big confrontation between Iran and its enemies? Or were you confident all along that it was saber rattling? How did you read it? Oh, no, I think we came very close to a big confrontation. I think Iran essentially was just a hair trigger away from pulling that trigger and destroying Israel and just bombarding Israel with a vast number of rockets. I think that that's that report was put out. And then we had uh, some back channel discussions, I believe, that happened in Lebanon. And then the result of that was that uh, I, I think that the, the shoot down of the airliner also may have been a warning to Iran uh, saying, do not fire those missiles at Israel. Uh, we will, you know, we can hack into your systems. See that I don't think that airliner shoot down was an accident by any means, Richie. I'm pretty sure that it was a hack that the, you know, the Zionists or Americans, somebody on that side, uh, was compromised the Russian equipment and also uh, hacked into that airliner, which was owned by a company run that's, you know, the owner is a billionaire Zio Nazi loyal to Israel. So the airliner undoubtedly turned off its uh, transponder. You know, the airliner itself was hacked. The Iranian system may have been hacked as well. And that plane was intentionally destroyed. And those people were intentionally killed as a warning to Iran. Just it was it was a carbon copy of the earlier warning to Iran that the U.S. military sent when the USS Vincennes shot down an Iranian airliner, killing nearly 300 <laughs> Iranian people, a lot of them women and children towards the end of the Iraq-Iran war, where the U.S. was supporting Iraq. Yeah. Iran had just won that war and was about to march on into Baghdad. And so the Americans shot down that airliner, murdering 300 Iranian civilians, saying, we'll murder every civilian in Iran if you try to do what you're planning to do. And this was the same situation. We're going to murder every civilian in Iran. We, we can do anything. We'll kill anybody if you fire those rockets at Israel. So the back-channel neg negotiations succeeded in preventing the rockets being fired at Israel, and the result was this limited strike on the American base. That's what I think happened. We were just uh, micrometers away from World War III. If the... If your version of what happened to the plane is correct, that it was a hacking um, exercise, why did the Iranian government say, yeah, we did it, we, we made a mistake, we apologize? Because that was the, uh, well, for first, it's actually less embarrassing to the Iranian government to say that. Just like when the people who blew up the Twin Towers went and blew up the Plasco building in Tehran, uh, using exactly the same method. Have you ever looked at that? You know, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 yeah, Truth has yeah. done a lot of work in the Plasco building. Obviously, that was the same team that destroyed the Twin Towers and Building 7 that destroyed the Plasco building. 
and Iran, I thought, should have told the truth about it. But they didn't because it's embarrassing to say that, you know, we've been infiltrated to that extent. Likewise, if they say that we've been infiltrated to the extent that they've hacked our air defense systems and can make us shoot down a civilian airliner, uh, that's a worse admission from their perspective than just saying, oh, sorry, we shut down the airliner. We'll make restitution. We are a responsible party, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, remember, this is part of a situation where the Iranians are facing the likelihood of a war in which uh, perhaps as much as a majority of their population is going to die almost instantly. So in that situation, uh, I think caution took over and uh, they, they behave you know, pretty responsibly as they usually do. But it's uh, we came really close to World War Three and it's the, the, the war isn't over. It's just low intensity. Um, you know, these rockets are still landing on the American embassy in Baghdad, and they're going to be more and more and more such things until the U.S. leaves the region, which it doesn't want to. So we're in the, this is an all out war right now with the U.S. and Israel going all out against the people in the region that don't want them there, which is the vast majority. Yeah, I have one final question for you. Thanks for coming back and sharing your time with us today. Your theory about the hacking is an interesting one. I hadn't really considered it. Uh, I'm not sure, but listen, it's you. So I will have a, a second look at it. Um, What's going to happen then? Because we know that the neocon Zionist puppets in D.C., we know they're hell-bent on a, a conflict with Iran um, to be scaled up to where it becomes, as you described, proper war. What's your prediction then, Kevin? Are they going to get it? Are they going to succeed? Are, will the next major conflict in the world be there in Iran? And will it be this year or next year? Or please God, if there is a God... Um, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to you, will it not happen? How do you see it panning out in the next 12 months, 24 months? Well, you know, God has seemingly helped the Islamic Republic survive against all odds over all of these years when it's been targeted by the world's most powerful forces. And so, uh, inshallah, that will continue. But it's a scary situation, Richie, right now. This insane so-called deal of the century was obviously put out there to get a firm rejection. That was the purpose of it. So what, what do they want a firm rejection for? Well, because they want more war. Uh, Netanyahu has never made any secret of the fact that he wants a huge war with Iran, which would allow him to finish the ethnic cleansing of Palestine by murdering uh, the rest of the Palestinian people uh, who are in you know the territory that he thinks is his, and then maybe expelling any of the wounded survivors. That's what Bibi wants. He wants a fog of war situation where he can finish the genocide of Palestine. And he almost got it. And, you know, Ronan Bergman's Rise and Kill First describes how the Mossad people stopped Bibi Netanyahu from getting that war repeatedly. Um, he ordered it. Bibi ordered an attack on Iran to start that war, and they stood up against him and didn't follow his orders. So now he's in charge, or at least as long, in as, long as he's out of prison, and he's got Trump under his control. Yeah. So it's a pretty bad situation, and uh, the Iranians aren't going to roll over. So uh, I, things could get very, very bad in the next year or two. What a coward he is, Netanyahu. The worst uh, coward ever to hold a high office anywhere. Trying to get his wife to take the rap for his, uh, for his crimes, for his financial crimes. What a bastard. Anyway, mate, I love having you on, Kevin. Thanks for coming back. I hope you'll be with us throughout the year. Again, because of your relationships with uh, the Press TV guys, very sorry to hear their YouTube channel was deleted. I know it's not the first time. I just wish that more people... You know, even those who don't agree with Press TV, they should stand up and speak out about it. Because it's the old adage. You know, if you just laugh at, at Press TV and say good riddance, well, laugh all you want, but it's going to be you next year. And if it's not next year, it's going to be you the year after. Um, if you want to have a final word on that, Kevin, have it now. Thanks for coming back on, my friend. Uh, give Rabia our uh, best regards. And uh, I wish you the best in 2020. And I look forward to you coming back on. Just a final word quickly on Press TV and, 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 and people laughing at the fact that they were deleted. Well, Press TV is uh, much freer than any comparable Western media. It's got a wider Overton window. That is the window of acceptable discourse. We have uh, alt-right people on Press TV. We have left-wingers, strong voices of the left all across the spectrum. It has a much broader uh, spectrum of opinion than any comparable Western outlet. So if you don't like Press TV, you don't like free speech. Tr uh, truthjihad.com, Kevin Barrett, uns.com. That's you for Umbrella, N for November, and... Z for, what is it, Kevin? What's the, uh, the, the, the phonetic alphabet? What's Z? Zulu, that's the one. UNZ, uns.com. Man, I love having you on. Thanks for coming back today. 
Thanks, Richie. Keep up the great work. Cheers, my friend. Uh, the brilliant Kevin Barrett, live from Wisconsin, truthjihad.com, uns.com. Kevin, I might ask Kevin uh, privately later on. I'd love to have Ron Uns on the program. Maybe Kevin could arrange it uh, because he is a Jewish man and he's a very good writer and he does uh, criticise the Israeli government. You see, he's the wrong Jew. He's the wrong type of Jew. Listen, before I go, don't panic, don't panic. I've got a crazy um, uh, amount of things to do uh, today domestically and I've not been well I've got to go now I'm going to go to we're back to two hours again tomorrow it's mostly two hours every day but I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm out of time today it's been a good show today anyway stop complaining uh, stop complaining um, but before I do go some of you have been looking into Alastair Stewart who was fired by ITV ITN and apparently he got into an argument on Twitter and he called a black gentleman a great ape He's a fucking idiot for doing that. Right? I was very honest on the live stream, the YouTube nonsense, last week when I talked about using the word nigger um, abusively one time when I was younger, much, much, much younger, <clears throat> after hours after, um, after a bar, and I regretted it. And I found the gentleman whom I used that language against and I apologised to him a few weeks later profusely. And um, he made me feel even worse because he said, ah, don't worry about it. He said, I was an arsehole. I said, yeah, but using words like that to, to have a go at people is pathetic. and It's wrong, you know. I wouldn't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm grown up now. I'm a smart guy. You shouldn't be calling people names like that. Ultimately, you shouldn't. You might make an argument that people deserve a second chance. That maybe ITN could suspend uh, uh, Alistair or ask him to make a donation um, to a charity. I don't know, but you shouldn't be calling people names like that. You know, people were calling black people monkeys for years, and then they were hanging them from fucking trees. Don't use language like that when you're talking to people. I'm not going to condemn anybody. I've said a lot of things, even on this radio show. Sometimes, you know, just to get a laugh, sometimes just to be a bit controversial, just to throw a grenade into the mix. But don't be calling people apes. And Alistair Stewart is not stupid. He would have known he was having an argument with a black dude. Right? Uh, David David Stanford mentions the match. David, the match isn't starting until quarter to eight, mate. I could be here. I've got things to do. It's got nothing to do with the match, believe you me, mate. Um, United are playing City at the Etihad tonight in about um, <clears throat> 90 minutes. Time has got no... It has no interest to me that... Uh, not tonight. Right, I'm going to wrap it up right there. Back with you tomorrow at 9.30 on YouTube for the newspaper thing. And I've got two brilliant guests tomorrow. I cannot wait uh, to uh, speak with a lovely lady called Miriam Henain, who's a documentary filmmaker, a broadcaster, a terrific lady. I've been watching her videos on YouTube and I've invited her on the radio program, Miriam Henain. She joins me tomorrow. And for the first time in 2020, Maria Heller drops in live from Arizona as well. Busy old show that is uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday. Thanks to Kevin Barrett as usual for his help. Thanks to you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Here's Lenny Kravitz. I'll speak to you tomorrow. Look after yourselves and one another. Bye for now. Bye.